Good morning, Cleveland. What a glorious day it is to be in worship with you. Uh, we might be worshiping from many different places, but the Holy Spirit brings us together as one church to worship wherever we happen to be. We start as we always do with a word of prayer, so if you'll bow your heads. Gracious and loving God, we ask your spirit to be with us today. Bring us all together in worship with you, and may all that we say and do today be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing. Morning has broken. Creed, a traditional affirmation of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to Come in the time uh, of the worship service for our announcements, and um, I'll start out with myself here, and you'll kind of see behind me a bunch of boxes and empty bookshelves, and uh, so I'm doing this worship service in this uh, spot just to kind of do two things. One, just to let you know uh, where uh, the, we are with the status of, of the move. Um, we're in the middle of the move, uh, Julie Soren and I, and uh, we've moved a lot of our stuff down to Lawrenceville, uh, still have uh, some other stuff to move out, both out of the church and, and the parsonage, and it's been a bittersweet week. Uh, for each of us, uh, for Soren, for Julie, and for myself. And so um, I'll covet your prayers uh, for the three of us uh, in this transition. Um, the other reason I wanted to show you this is because I'm being particularly lazy in this worship service and sitting down. Uh, I can tell you that this there's a lot of tradition to this, that the rabbis 
of the uh, of biblical times would sit down and teach the lessons, but uh, in reality, I'm just very, very tired today. Um, excited about worship, but tired at the same time. So uh, if you'll bear with me with this background behind me, um, I thought I would do this uh, for our worship service this morning. Um, there, uh, I know many of you probably are still asking the questions about when things can get started back and, um, and uh, when meetings can begin to tar start taking place. And um, I've been in contact with the leadership of the church. We had a meeting a week ago Monday, uh, the church council did. Uh, I also have been talking about these things with the incoming pastor, Jamie uh, Hudgens, and um, we're going to wait till July. There doesn't seem to be a good idea to make the uh, move to reopening things, whether that's having fellowship dinners or choirs on Wednesday or uh, worship on Sundays uh, if, if uh, things are, are during this transition time. And so asking for your patience and your grace with uh, the church, with the leadership of the church, and with the new pastor, um, it's a, not only a, a questionable time about opening up with regard to um, the effects of the coronavirus and COVID-19, but it's particularly difficult to do that uh, as we have a transition. And so we're going to um, leave that decision to be made uh, sometime in July. And uh, but but look for those um, look for those. Uh, uh, the decision to be made and, and, and the announcements uh, in your emails. Um, we'll make sure that we uh, get you an email and let you know where the church is and what the status of the church. In the meantime, uh, there are some ways that you can help. Uh, you know, no matter when this happens, when reopening happens, uh, there'll be some sanitizing of the church that needs to take place, and so we'll need volunteers to do that. We'll need the volunteers on an ongoing basis. Uh, on Sunday mornings, for example, uh, in between two worship services, if that's the uh, the way that uh, we're going to start back up with two worship services. But after the worship after the worship services are done, uh, to sanitize chairs and and the uh, and the area around you, um, you could also donate. Um, uh, there'll be mass. We'll hand out mass. I think anytime that people uh, meet publicly in the uh, upcoming several months, that that uh, different groups will be meeting. It'd be, it's always a good idea to have mass. And so the disposable mass would be a good good thing that you can donate to the church. Uh, little personal hand sanitizers, uh, whether they're the, uh, the regular hand sanitizers or spray bottles. Uh, I've received a lot of spray bottles of um, it, essentially it's just alcohol, 80% alcohol, um, and it uh, kills the virus. Um, and the idea is that we would hand those little personal uh, hand sanitizers out to each person as they come into the door of the church. And so um, I've been buying those um, uh, alcohol bottles uh, at um, uh, uh, Ingalls, and you know you just spray them on your hands on anything that you might touch, and and that helps to keep things sanitized. But if you have a different place to buy little personal hand sanitizers. Um, I encourage you to do that. That'd be a good thing to do for your church, and you can donate those. Um, wipes, Clorox uh, wipes, or um, uh, other sanitizing wipes uh, that the surfaces can be wiped down. So uh, masks and personal hand sanitizers and um, um, uh, wipes, uh, sanitizing wipes would be great things that you could donate to your church, and I encourage you to go ahead and do that um, And uh, when you're out shopping. And I appreciate all of those uh, ways that you can help out. Um, we're going to go through, and, I, and I'm going to ask for your patience here because we had technical issues with the worship service last week, and so didn't have a chance to go through prayer requests from last week. So this is a, a, essentially a combined two weeks of prayer requests, uh, and I, so I want to call your attention to these individuals. Uh, one is one that we've been praying for for a while, Riva Sarambitsky, over the last month, uh, has uh, had pneumonia. She's not tested positive for the virus, but she has had a very, very serious case of pneumonia that has put her in the hospital for the first time for 17 days. And I know the first several days of that, uh, she was in ICU. Uh, I understand about a week ago that she was back in the hospital. And uh, my apologies to you, my apologies to Dennis. I have not get, gotten in contact with him uh, to check on her this week. Uh, it's been just one of those types 
types of weeks. But uh, I will try to contact Dennis Spees and let you know how Reva Serambitsky is doing. But continue to pray for her. Susan Rodber, about a week and a half ago, uh, maybe not that quite, well, about a week ago, maybe Thursday, uh, had um, um, uh, hip surgery, her hip re re replacement surgery. If you're friends with her on Facebook, she's been real excited about what they were able to do. They were doing some uh, newfangled uh, medical work uh, in replacing that surgery, and she's healing quite well, uh, and she's doing that down in Florida, uh, already fully back on Facebook that I've noticed, and uh, is healing well. So just continue to pray for Susan's full recovery there. Madeline Tolbert's been in a lot of pain. Her rotator cuff uh, might need some work done on it. Don't know whether she faces surgery or not, but she's been in a lot of pain. Um, when you have pain like that in the shoulder or other, other uh, joints in your body, that pain tends to radiate, and I know that, uh, that sh the pain is radiating on uh, half of her body, and so just uh, be praying for her. We don't know what the future holds in terms of surgery or treatment for that, but uh, I know uh, anybody that's in pain would appreciate uh, your prayer. So that's Madeline Tolbert. Um, Russell Pruitt, and I apologize to Russell for not calling him and checking on his son, uh, but Russell's son and uh, his girlfriend or significant other, I, I don't think they're married, but uh, they're both nurses and they've come down with the coronavirus. They've tested positive for that. The good news is that they're young. By, that, by now they might be fully over the coronavirus. Um, um, but it, it, it's going to take them away from their work and it's going to affect their work in a, in a, as, as first responders. And so we want to be praying for uh, Russell's son and his girlfriend. Um, earlier this week, uh, Charlene Kay went down to Florida. Her mother has been on hospice care for the last couple of weeks, but she stopped eating recently. And um, uh, Charlene and, uh, had been hearing from her sister about the, health, the decline in health of, uh, of her mother. This is uh, Phyllis Britton, and so she passed away um, a few days ago. And so our, our sweet Charlene, our great pianist here at the church, uh, her heart has got to be hurting. Uh, as I mentioned to people, I remember mentioning this to my uh, father when his, his mother died at the age of 102, um, that you're never, uh, you're never too old to lose your mother. There's something special there uh, with a mother, and uh, Charlene lost her father uh, just, just within the last year or two, and so we want to be praying for Charlene during the loss of uh, Phyllis Britton and be praying for um, uh, the whole family there. I got an, a text message, uh, was in a text message conversation with Lauren Cornett who wanted to give me an update on Mark Sloan. Mark Sloan is a friend of hers in, uh, from Florida uh, and he's been, um, he's been diagnosed uh, with a uh, stage 3 myeloma uh, cancer and uh, he's facing about four to six months of weekly IV treatments um, and um, the prognosis uh, the doctors are, have some hope there, or some some um, uh, positive uh, uh, prognosis for Mark, and so a little bit of good news there. But he's got a, a long road uh, to haul in front of him, and I know that he can use our prayers too. So uh, continue to pray for Mark Sloan. That's uh, Lauren Cornett's friend down in Florida, and I appreciate you doing that. Let's take a moment of silent prayer, and then we'll pray together as a congregation. If you'll bow your heads. Gracious and loving God, I just ask your blessings on your church. I ask your blessings on all those that we've named this morning. I ask your blessings upon uh, every single person that's going through this uh, uh, period of time and uh, those that have been affected by the virus by coming down with it and those who've lost loved ones because of it. Uh, but each and every one of us who uh, are seeking to continue to be the church during uncertain times, give us the grace to know that uh, we uh, are, are so needed in the world and that there's so much for us to be doing. We give you thanks uh, for the opportunity to worship. It may be an unusual worship, an online worship, and worshiping in our own homes, but it is still worth the worship. Uh, of you when you bring us together as a church. And so we give you all praise, honor, and glory for that opportunity to worship you. 
Um, ask your blessings upon um, uh, the church particular in Cleveland, upon um, uh, the current pastor Ted and, and, and Julie, but also upon the incoming pastor Jamie um, and uh, all of those that are uh, affected by changes such as this. Um, help, uh, help us to um, know that you are the one that is guiding us in, in all, of these, um, all of these changes. Uh, bless us, Lord. Bless us as a church. Bring us together. And we uh, ask all of this in the holy name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, uh, who, when he was with his disciples, taught them to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of St. Luke. It's the very end of the Gospel, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join us as we sing. In the garden. In the garden. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer? Almighty and everlasting God, may the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my lips be acceptable to you, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I'm in the middle of a sermon series. This is the second out of three sermons of uh, that I am entitling um, Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen. And I've taken that title from uh, the TV show MASH. The final episode of the TV show MASH was entitled that. And uh, I spoke a little bit about a couple of characters from MASH last week, and I'll speak about one this week as well, or in my sermon today as well. Um, but I... Um, 
I wanted to just kind of let you know that what I'm doing is I'm taking some farewell messages or the final words that we find in, in uh, uh, different books of the Bible. Last week it was First Thessalonians. This week it is the Gospel of Luke. Um, and I encourage you, I'm going to do kind of verse by verse preaching today, um, what I call Sunday school preaching. And if you have your Bibles ready, open them up and follow along with me. You don't need them. I, I'll read the verses out to you as I preach. But if you'd like to do that, go ahead and pull your Bibles out uh, with you. Um, the Gospel of Luke, um, this isn't going to be any news to the people that come to the Bible study on Thursday nights. The Gospel of the Luke is my favorite of the four Gospels. Um, there's something to be said about each of the four Gospels, and one of the ways that I think about them is, what would we be missing in the world? What would we be missing about uh, Jesus and our relationship with Jesus if we were missing this particular Gospel? Uh, and so you can apply that to each of the four Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, I think, has a sense of urgency to it. You know of the drama that is going on in Jesus' life from the very beginning, the challenges that he has with the religious authorities and the sense of urgency that he has to heal people and to, uh, and to bring love into the world and those types of things. And, and so Mark has that, uh, that real sense of of there's something that needs to be done and something that needs to be changed in the world. And uh, you could read the Gospel of Mark in a matter of a couple of hours or something, even probably less time than that. Uh, and it's a marvelous, uh, the shortest of the four Gospels, is, but, it, but it's a marvelous one. It's also the first of the four Gospels that was written down. Uh, and so for that, it, it, it's the opening uh, ideas of the, the very idea of the Gospel as the good news of Jesus Christ uh, is started there in Mark. Um, when you read Matthew, you get this strong sense of Jesus is the continuation of all that God has done from the beginning of the world. And uh, Matthew has got these wonderful teaching lessons in it. I think the scholars call them the five great discourses. And uh, Jesus takes these opportunities to teach people deeply in the Gospel of Matthew, and um, there's, no, uh, there's no better teaching that you find anywhere in the Bible than the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so when you think of uh, Matthew, you would lose that sense of Jesus as, as teacher, um, as somebody that is fulfilling the Old Testament, that's fulfilling the, the laws of, of Moses and the, the laws of the Jewish people. Um, John is the poetry of the four Gospels. Uh, and, and, and if you ask that question, what would I miss if I didn't have the Gospel of John? Well, you would miss those opening words, those opening 14 verses of the Gospel. Uh, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on, uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's a beautiful way of starting the good news of Jesus Christ in the world. And so, uh, the poetry continues. I mean, chapter 3, when Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus and we hear those immortal words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Um, we would miss those words without the, uh, without, um, the gospel. And then later on, Jesus says, uh, be not afraid. Um, uh, you know, my father, I mean, I go before you to prepare a place for you in my father's house. Uh, there are many, many mansions, many rooms. Um, you'd miss that. Um, the Gospel of John is a very personal gospel, and I, my guess is that if you were to do a survey of Christians who had an idea of what their favorite gospel was, um, that's the one that would probably win the survey. Luke is my favorite gospel because I think if we went without the Gospel of Luke, we would miss so much in the world and in our relationship with Jesus. Uh, Luke has the best Christmas story, starting with the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the Ascension. Uh, oh my goodness, I can't speak today. But uh, starting with the angel, uh, the angel Gabriel coming to um, tell Mary of the uh, upcoming birth, through the narrative of uh, the birth of Jesus and. 
uh, shepherds in a field and, and angels, um, uh, the, the story of Christmas. Uh, Matthew's got some of that story. Matthew's got the birth of Jesus and the visit of the wise men and uh, so forth. But the, the bulk of the story that we have about Jesus' birth we get uh, only in the Gospel of Luke. If we didn't have Luke, we'd be missing the two best parables of Jesus. Uh, one of them is uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Could you imagine a world where the Good Samaritan was not a part of our uh, everyday lives, understanding uh, that parable? And then the other is the greatest of all the parables, the parable of the prodigal son, the lost sons, uh, as I call it. Um, you don't find that particular parable in that form in any of the other three Gospels. And so we'd be missing it. We'd miss, be missing a big part of the heart of Jesus. And I think the Gospel of Luke does a great job with the Easter stories, the post-resurrection stories. And that brings me to where I'm at today. Um, this is, these are the final words that we find uh, in the Easter stories. And so far, just to give you a, a, just a little bit of background before we get into our scripture, uh, Jesus, of course, is risen from the tomb. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. The stone was rolled away, and uh, the, the women went to the tomb, and they found it empty. And then they encountered two men uh, that spoke to them and then sent them on their way and they went and told the disciples about it. Peter ran to the tomb uh, and he also found it empty. And then we have this long story in uh, Luke 24, a uh, long resurrection story of two disciples who were on a road to Emmaus and they encounter the risen Christ along the road. They don't know he's the Christ. They don't recognize him as Jesus at first. Um, but he starts to talk to them about scripture along the way and how uh, Jesus was the fulfillment of scripture and that he is brought into one of, the, one of these disciples' homes and he breaks bread with them and that is when their eyes are opened up. It's a beautiful story um, and uh, a wonderful resurrection story that, that reaches each of our hearts. Um, here in our, our story uh, that we're encountering today is, is later that night, that same night, the, those two disciples on the road, uh, road to Emmaus, have come back to Jerusalem. Uh, they've run back to Jerusalem. Uh, they've run into the upper room. They've told all the rest of the disciples about what, the, what has occurred to them and, and what they encountered along the road. Uh, and then it's th at that moment that Jesus comes into the upper room, the resurrected Christ, uh, and says hello to them, uh, be not afraid, uh, he, you know, uh, encounters them and uh, appears before them, even eats fish in front of them, uh, shows them his wounds, and, um, and this is where we are in the story. Uh, now that Jesus has proven to his disciples, now that Jesus has shown himself to his loved ones, he wants to leave them with some parting words. And this is where I think Luke has done it well. Uh, you don't have you, you do have a great commission in Matthew, but it seems so formal. It's up on a mountaintop. It's go out and proclaim to the world and everything. Uh, Mark's gospel just kind of leaves it uh, up in the air. What happens after Easter Sunday, and uh, John's gospel does a similar thing. It's, it's got some concluding words at the end of chapter twenty, but then it picks up with a wonderful narrative post uh, Easter narrative in chapter twenty one, and so. Um, it's a fascinating uh, uh, thing that it's really only in Luke do we kind of get some finality to the story. Luke begins his gospel by saying, I want to give you an orderly account of the life of Jesus Christ. And now he is finishing that orderly account with the final words of Jesus. And so let's, let's pick up there in verse 44. This is uh, Luke 24, verse 44. Uh, it says that Jesus uh, said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, 
that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. One of the things that uh, I think is important to know when you read the Gospel of Luke is the importance of remembering things, of being able to make the connections between things. Uh, Luke is also the author of Acts. That's kind of chapter two or book two of this story of Jesus and his church. And so Luke and Acts are a two-part uh, story of that. And um, it's important for uh, the, the disciples to know that this whole story uh, story of the Old Testament from the creation of the world uh, through uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through um, the deliverance from Egypt and Moses, through uh, Joshua, the, the conquest of the, of the promised land, and the uh, establishment of kings, King David and King Solomon, and all the kings that followed after them, uh, through all the prophets that we read in the Old Testament, uh, all concluding here with Jesus Christ. And, and that's one of the things that Jesus wants to tell them, is this is a fulfillment of everything that God has been seeking to do in the world up until now and into the future. Now we'll get to the future here in a moment because what he's going to be telling his disciples is remember, remember my words because I now want you to take those words out into the world to all the nations and we'll get to that in a moment. He continues to say that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. Well those four words are really important and Jesus uh, has said this to them three times while he was alive with them. Just a reminder that the Messiah is to suffer and to die and then will be raised on the third day. Uh, he's mentioned that to them three days and these disciples, three times, these disciples have never gotten it prior to now. Um, we're going to hear how they get it here in just a moment. And, and, and one of the ways that, the, that that's going to happen is through the promise of the Holy Spirit. But um, prior to this moment, prior to the resurrected Christ speaking to his disciples, the disciples haven't gotten it. And the scripture is pretty clear about that. Their minds have not been opened. They're not quite ready. Uh, they have not been changed until this moment, until this encounter with the resurrected Christ. Um, their hearts and their minds are going to be opened to the scriptures, it says, uh, by Jesus. And that's a good first step to be changed, to become the change uh, that the world needs you to be, as, as one great person once quoted, uh, quoted from them. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that I was going to talk about another character from uh, MASH. Um, um, there were essentially four of the major characters from the TV show uh, that started out in day one for season one, episode one of MASH and made it all the way to the finale. Um, I spoke about two of those characters last week. They were a little bit more minor characters. One was uh, Max Klinger and the other was Father Mulcahy. And so you can watch my sermon next week to, or last week to see what I said about them. Um, probably next week now that I'm doing this, I didn't know that I was going to do this with MASH for so long. But uh, since I've done it two times, I might as well finish it with a third time. But next week I'll talk about Hawkeye Pierce, who's the central character of the show. Um, the one I wanted to talk about today is probably the character that changed the most over the 13 seasons that MASH was on the air, and that's uh, Major Margaret Houlihan. When the show starts, um, she's kind of the butt of the joke. Um, she's uh, dating or is having an affair with Major Frank Burns, and he is the buffoon of the show. He's uh, stupid and incompetent and uh, Hawkeye and Trapper John are, make fun of him all the time. They play practical jokes on him all the time. Uh, and she's not left out of those jokes. They play jokes on her as well and she's, um, sorry for the language, but she's the butt of the jokes. Uh, that um, Hawkeye and Trapper uh, play in, in, in the show. And um, 
the other thing about her is, and, and this is true of Frank, is they're both kind of whiny characters. They're, they're the majors in the unit, they're the second in command, um, but they're always trying to get uh, the captains, Hawkeye and Trapper, they're trying to get them in trouble all the time. Um, and you know, calling generals on on the mash unit, and and, uh, and, and and they're just whiny and crying, and they go and uh, uh, they go to the the superiors just just uh, complaining all the time about them, and and you you get this kind of sense, uh, you know, they're funny. I mean, the show is a funny show throughout, especially starting out, and so you, you, you uh, enjoy the practical jokes that are on them, but you don't particularly like Frank Burns uh, and Margaret Houlihan. Uh, by sometime midway through the show, her ch character begins to change. And even though it's a comedy, I, I call it a dramedy, it's kind of a, MASH has always had its uh, serious edge to it as well, but even though it's a comedy, um, Margaret Houlihan becomes less Joker-like, less, less funny, less um, comical. She becomes a, a more important character, uh, and in some ways, uh, takes on a, um, I, I mentioned that Father Mulcahy is the, mor the moral center of the show uh, as the local priest there, but um, uh, Houlihan is the one that kind of centers everything. And the way that um, women often do in, in certain cultures and groups, um, she's the one that gives people the, um, the strength they need to carry on. And so by the end of the show, uh, she becomes this a very, very important character. She has somehow changed. We don't know what's changed her. We don't know how she has matured over time. Um, uh, but she's changed and become a more likable, more important, more central character to the show uh, and, and the storylines that take place. And that is the type of thing that has happened to these disciples. They've witnessed a lot. They have witnessed uh, Jesus healing people and teaching people, and um, they have watched where the religious authorities and, and other authorities have begun to plot against Jesus and, and try to kill him. And they've been watching these things. They've watched the courage of Jesus uh, during the during the um, the arrest and the trials, um, of course, they most of these disciples kind of disappeared when the danger came up, but they knew what was going on. And of course, Jesus's crucifixion on top of Calvary, and so they've been witnesses of all of this. They've been witnesses of the amazing resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they're changed. At one time. Um, they were buffoons. At one time, they didn't know. Their eyes were closed, their minds were closed, and, and they were not a particularly intelligent group of people. But they're going to go on, as I said in the second book, in the book of Acts, they're going to go on with the power of the Holy Spirit to transform the world. And Jesus needs them to be a changed people, to remember all that he has said and done, and to take it into a world that so much needs to hear this message. And so what is the message? That's the next part of this. It says uh, that, uh, that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and then this is the message that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And that message is kind of echoed also in the Great Commission that we find in the Gospel of Matthew, but here it is summarized in the Gospel of Luke. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. The message is the cross. The centrality of the gospel, the central focus of all we are and all we do as a church is the cross of Jesus. 
It's the bridge to life. It's the bridge to forgiveness. I've mentioned this several times, but I'm always surprised that our world seems to devalue forgiveness. And we do that as individual Christians too. It's almost like we are we think of um, asking for forgiveness and forgiving others as a sign of weakness. But when you think of the cross of Jesus Christ, the Romans would tell you that was when Jesus was at his weakest. Oh, they were probably laughing when they nailed the nails into his hand when they put a crown of thorns on his head and they watched him breathe, lose his breath. They were probably laughing when they stripped him naked and nailed him onto a cross because how humiliating could that possibly be? What an embarrassing thing to happen to anything, anybody is what the Romans were probably saying. But in reality, it's the greatest powerful, it is the most powerful thing that has ever taken place. Because it's the agent of forgiveness. It's the agent of a divine relationship with human beings. It's the bridge that crosses the divide between us and God. And so that's the message. Whatever we, uh, else we do as a church, and there is so much that we're called to do. We're called to be in ministry to people. We're called to be compassionate toward people. We're called to proclaim justice. Uh, and and when, we, when we see people that are treated unfairly and we see oppression in the world, we are called to do so many things. But at the center of Everything that we are to do as a church is to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins because Jesus died on a cross and was raised from the tomb. I mean, amen. Amen. Jesus isn't quite done with them yet. He goes on and he proclaims in, in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things and I need you to witness for me, he says. And this is how I'm going to help you out. I'm going to send to you what my father promised. And he's talking about here the Holy Spirit. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And that's going to take place here very shortly. At the very beginning of the book of Acts, we will read in the, uh, in the second chapter, we will read that the disciples receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And this is what Jesus is saying to them. Once that happens, you are to take that message that I just said to you and take it into a world that needs it so much. And then verse 50 says, Jesus took him and led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. There's two things that I want to say about this ascension being carried up, Jesus carried up into heaven. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that I think that Jesus being carried into heaven is less about a place and more about who Jesus is. And what I mean by that is that Jesus has been exalted. Jesus is Lord because Jesus chose the nails. He went to the cross. He died on Calvary and he was resurrected. And now he is brought not so much to a place, but into a, a full relationship at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, our creed says. And so that's what, it, that's what this is. This is both an, <clears throat> an ascension from earth to heaven, but it's not so much that Jesus is in heaven and is, and is away from us as it is a... a, 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 a a status. He has now become the Lord of the heavens and the earth. 
The second thing I want to say about this is if, if, you, if you know your Bible uh, halfway decently well, uh, th these words here that he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven will recall a particular event that takes place in the history of Israel, and that is when the prophet Elijah is carried up into heaven. You might remember the chariots of fire, the chariot of fire that takes him up into heaven. Uh, he's carried up into a, by a whirlwind uh, uh, into heaven, um, and he leaves behind the next prophet of Israel, Elisha. And so Jesus, uh, Elijah has done his work, and the work that remains is for Elisha. And so one of the things that I think Luke is doing with that image is telling us that Jesus has done his work, and he's now been carried into heaven, and the work that remains is for us. And so his very final words, or the, I should say the very final words of the Gospel of Luke, begins to tell us about the work of the church. And this is who we are, and this is where I'm going to close my sermon. I want you to hear these words and hear them as the work of the church, the first words that are spoken in the Bible about who we are. And the disciples worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. Oh, may it be so that we in our lives are continually blessing God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the time in our worship service where we normally take up the offering. And so I want to uh, remind you of uh, the financial challenge that the church is having by not having in-person worship on a regular basis and being able to take up the, that offering on a regular basis. Um, this is a, a good opportunity for you to continue to mail in your checks. If you're not already doing so, that you can start ma mailing in checks. Uh, if you want to get set up on an automatic bank draft plan, um, call the church and we'll get you in touch with our treasurer and uh, she will get you set up to do that as well. Um, I know that a lot of people during this time is, are going through financial difficulties, uh, but please don't forget your church. Uh, we are running behind the giving. It's not going to be a surprise to any of you out there, but we are running behind in giving compared to last year, uh, and we don't want to make that deficit any any larger than it has to be during this time. And so I encourage you to um, continue to give to your church. Let's take a moment. I want to pray for you uh, in this uh, the offering of ourselves and our uh, resources to God, if you'll bow your heads. Gracious and loving God, I ask your blessings on all of your church and just their lives, the ways in which they are uh, blessing you by the work that they are doing in this world. And I, I just want to uh, ask your blessings upon uh, each of your children uh, at Cleveland United Methodist Church. Um, bless the money, bless the gifts, the tithes that are brought to you, that are mailed into you this week. Uh, may they be used through your church to transform your world. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. I see the stars.
Sisters and brothers, we are the Church of Jesus Christ, and God's hope is that each and every one of us loves being the Church, that wherever we happen to be in the world, whoever we might come into contact with, that we are the Church in that place and for that person. And so God is calling us to depart from this worship service, to serve God and to serve our neighbor in all we do. Amen.